Well, the dust is settling on election day, and we've had uh, we've had some how how shall we put it interesting uh, interesting things to talk about around the building this morning. Even before I got on the air, uh, I don't know that you would call it a major upset, but there was a change of the guard over at the Twin Falls City Council, or there will be at the end of this uh, this current term, and that is that Rebecca Milsoika, uh, who'd been in, in serving in the council for well, at least for one term of her own, and also filling out an appointed term was defeated, and uh, defeated by a very small percentage by Ruth Pierce. Uh, this was in District 7 of the Twin Falls City Council. Now, if you consider that Rebecca Milsoika is somewhat of the outsider candidate, that may well be why there were people out there who were looking to recruit folks to run against her. And I'm not taking any part in this. I'm just telling you that's what I hear scuttlebutt around the office. Is that she was not uh, she was not considered a team player by many of her fellow members of the council, so it was decided that perhaps they could find someone else who could unseat her. Also, the the difference in the votes may also be attributable to the the third place finisher in the race, and that was Bethany Rasmussen, who was uh, a younger candidate who was looking to get aboard the, the council and was primarily focused on the refugee issue, captured enough votes, and if she was also viewed as an outsider candidate, perhaps if there had not been a third candidate, Rebecca Milsoika would still be a member of the Twin Falls City Council going into next year. So that was one of the more unusual races there. Uh, we had a we had a shakeup in government in Kimberly, and people there are not happy about this notion of uh, floating a bond issue to pay uh, for a new uh, water system. And I don't know, I guess... They're going to dig holes in the backyard at this point in order to settle that. So we had a shakeup there. The public mood is not one right now of wanting to do a lot of borrowing and spending. And elsewhere around the, the region, there were no, well, what I would consider great surprises. We had concentrated a little bit last night during our coverage right here on the air on what was going on at Hazleton with the chicken ordinance, uh, which went down to defeat. You will not be able to have uh, chickens in your backyard in Hazleton, at least not for now. Uh, the difference was about six and a half points when the final margins were counted. So we have those things uh, those things that people will be looking at over the next couple of days and trying to come up with some meaning behind all of this. It's 10 minutes after 8 o'clock. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. And just going through the list this morning of, of various races, lots of people who have been in uh, political office before in many of our local towns. And then had gone away, decided they wanted to get back in. So some old faces are the new faces. Generally, though, I would imagine in, in most communities, you're not going to see any major shakeups. Now, Benito Baeza was explaining this morning that there was a tie for a council seat in Murtaugh. You have two people who've, uh, who've come to a tie. Likely we'll settle this by a coin flip. My guess is it's not going to be a lengthy recount. There were only 18 total votes in that race, and they were tied 9-9. Nine to nine. So it wouldn't take long to sit down and say, okay, it, you know, looking for a discrepancy? Probably not. So it will come down to a coin flip at some point. How do you, in a tie, get the first call on that? Is the first person who comes into the room to the coin flip, do they get to call it? Or do you flip a coin in order to determine who gets to call the coin flip? Yeah, it starts to get a little complex in all of that. There's not much, I think, otherwise that you can read out of elections in Idaho, at least not in the Magic Valley, but across the country, there are people who are trying to make sense of, of what happened in some cases yesterday. Did you know that in Houston, Texas, the bathroom bill went down to defeat? Now, the liberals who are backing this, they say it was not a bathroom bill per se. They say, you know, there was much more to all of this. In other words, they're trying to obscure the fact that if this bill had passed, Men who think they are women or claim they are women could go into a girl's bathroom. People don't like that sort of stuff. And yes, there were a lot of other provisions in that law. It's a bit like the add the words bill in Idaho. But there are a lot of other provisions in that law, and maybe no one had a problem with that. But if there's just one point, then that's going to happen. Also, a conservative ended up winning the governor's race, only the second Republican ever elected governor in Kentucky. And according to media, he was going to lose right up until just a few days ago. And then they said, well, he's going to lose, but it'll be close. And then he ended up winning, and it wasn't even close. So once again, the, the Inside the Beltway crowd and other folks in mainstream media across the country, they goofed. They, 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 they're not able to read. They, they sit there and say, well, the American people believe. 
They don't know anybody. They live in their own little echo chamber. And you have a Republican governor reelected, reelected in Mississippi. His opponent knew things. The game was over early. The Democrats spent only three thousand dollars in the race for governor. I mean, you know, it it, it pretty much uh, much should tell you that. Also, marijuana legalization went down to defeat in Ohio. So you've got all of these social issues suddenly. And the new governor of Kentucky, he supports that county clerk. Her name was Kim Davis, who said she was not going to issue same-sex marriage licenses. He supported her openly, was photographed with her, circulated that in campaign advertising. So perhaps America hasn't changed as much as people in mainstream media would like to tell you. I have another theory as to why we're suddenly seeing all of these dramatic dramatic vote swings going back. The pendulum is swinging the other way. And let me tell you why. Here's some headlines and some stories that I compiled last night just before we went on air with our election coverage. This is from the Daily Caller. Taxpayer-funded university wants to suppress the words rape and crazy. Because they say if you use the word rape in saying, well, our football team got raped the other day, that diminishes rape victims. And also using the word crazy out of context could make people with mental illness feel sad. And thus, for example, according to officials at this school in Nebraska, it's wrong to say Purdue's football team raped Nebraska's cellar-dwelling team 55 to 45 on Saturday. Other words and phrases school officials have now deemed offensive include man up, which reinforces masculine stereotypes that are unhealthy. (laughs) And you can't use the word ghetto any longer, which misrepresents the experiences of others and negatively stereotypes minority groups. That's according to the university. Oh, how about this headline? Father, adopted son, seek right to marry each other. This comes from the very reputable CBS affiliate in Washington, D.C., It says, if you ask Nito Esposito and his partner five years ago when they thought same-sex marriage would be legal, they'd say the day would never come. So one adopted the other so they could share benefits. They're only 10 years apart. One is 78, the other is 68. Now that same-sex marriage is legal, they would like to get married, even though one is father and son. And a judge said, I'm sympathetic, but legally you are still father and son, and father and son can't marry. But they'd still like to go ahead and do it. Here's another one. Daily Caller. Protesters say Harvard Law School seal is racist and needs to be decolonized. Activist at Harvard University calling for the university's law school to abolish and replace its long-standing seal because it is based on the crest of a family that owns slaves, who've been dead a very, very long time but gave the money to open the law school. And uh, the fellow who actually gave the money, his name was Royal. The school is named after him. There's a chair called the Royal Chair for the Dean of the Law School, And it says, when Elena Kagan, now U.S. Supreme Court Justice, was the dean of the Harvard Law School, she refused to sit in the chair because, well, you know, 250 years ago, Royals' family owned slaves. Not in the United States, we should point out. They owned slaves in Antigua. Whatever. 815, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And voters are dealing with these stories, and then they're dealing with this one. GOPUSA.com. Actually, this has been reported by multiple sources. Department of Education, that's the federal, that's the one in Washington. Department of Education orders Illinois School District to allow boy to shower with girls. Illinois' largest high school district violated federal law by barring a transgender student from using the girls' locker room, according to the federal government. School officials did not comply with Title IX, the federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, which was adopted 40-some years ago in order to make sure that there were as many girls' sports teams as there were boys' sports teams and that everyone had equal access to chemistry class. Not to share the locker rooms, my friends. So you've got this going on, talk stalled between the school and the government when the school said, hey, you know, we offered a private bathroom to the uh, boy who thinks he's a girl. And then someone said, why, that's offensive and hurt his feelings. And now he's sad. So therefore, he gets to go shower with the girls. And so why are people suddenly rejecting and and why are we seeing the pendulum swing back the other way? Can I just put it plainly? I have just one child. I have a daughter. She's a grown-up now, but I was a very protective father for a stretch when she was younger. And I'm telling you right now, even now that she's she's a grown-up, I'm telling you right now, If she's in the shower, a public shower, or she's in a public restroom, I don't want some individual with a penis coming into that room while she's in there. Do you understand that? 
And I think most every father in the country feels the same way. And likely every mother in the country feels the same way. Unless you are some godforsaken idiot liberal who seems to believe, well, hey, this will be good for everyone. That is why the pendulum is swinging. And maybe there's a lesson in next year's presidential race and national elections and elections statewide next year. And that is we can actually still focus on these things and we can draw the votes of Americans who still believe that we have a little, we need a little sanity in this culture. 817, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. The school superintendent of that school in Illinois was trying to explain all of this last night to Megan Kelly. The problem is he's trying to be politically correct while he tries to explain that his parents don't want little boys going into the shower with little girls. And it's a little difficult for the superintendent to actually get the words out while he was on Fox News Channel. While we respect and honor transgender students and transgender identity, it is our responsibility to create an environment that is uh, protective and built on principles of respecting the privacy of all of our students. Okay, I get and all that, but, to, like, but to, I'm trying to cut mm -hmm. through sort of the academic speak and get to what specifically is it? What are you worried will happen? We believe that our accommodations provide uh, a great deal of support to our transgender students. And in our uh, plan, what we believe that we're able to work through is what uh, transgender students would request and, and uh, benefit from, honestly. They would uh, request uh, privacy themselves, and our accommodations would provide that. No, 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 I get it that. Affords... I get that. And, we, and we've made clear, the, the, the district tried. It tried many things. It gave her a private bathroom. Then mm -hmm. it moved that bathroom closer to the locker room, and it made it adjoining to the locker room. You allow her to play on the girls' sports teams and all the other things. But I'm trying to get at what is the concern that you have if you have to go this extra level that the Obama administration has said you have to, which is to let her use the actual girls' locker room as she wishes. Yeah, so our position is that she would be using the girls' locker room, and our position is that transgender students could access uh, those facilities. Where we differ in our position is that we are uh, requesting a, an agreement and a commitment on behalf of transgender students that they would um, um, observe a measure of privacy. In privacy in our locker rooms is a fundamental, critical uh, right that we believe is protected for all of our students. We should point out she's the best player on the girls' softball team at six feet four with a hairy chest and great big biceps. She's been hitting home runs left and right off the other girls. 20 minutes after 8 o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX. If you've got a comment or question, hold on. We've got a short break, but I'll be glad to take your comments on this subject and just why that we have now seen liberalism push too far and how that is going to impact next year's election rounds. That's on the way. 33. Going to be a chilly morning, but a sunny morning, which is, well, partly sunny. Nice after what we've seen the last couple of days. You know, when I was a teenager, I had no trouble figuring out what I was. They'd sit me down in algebra class next to some good-looking girl and I couldn't concentrate on Theorem 5-9. I was just completely lost looking at somebody next to me. My hormones were raging. Speaking of hormones, today we're going to be talking to a representative from the office of Dr. Jonathan Tripp in about 10 minutes. We call it Better Health with Tripp Family Medicine. We do that between 8.30 and 9 o'clock on Wednesday mornings. And one of the professionals from the office will be joining us in studio. We can take your telephone calls as well. We'll discuss a little bit about what we mean when we talk about hormones and imbalances and how to bring them back into balance and the, the effect it can have on your overall well-being. So that's on the way. And we do want to remind you, uh, Trip Family Medicine is located on Fillmore Street across from the main post office right here in Twin Falls. And remember as well, life's too short not to feel good. Our telephone number, if you'd like to reach the program today, uh, perhaps you have some sort of defense of boys going into the girls' shower. Uh, and, and you think that, you know, we're all being mean-spirited or not. But our telephone number, if you'd like to reach the program, 736-0300. The bill that failed, and by, by 25 points in Houston, Texas. A lot of people had been watching that nationally, too. And, and you had a big push. The ACLU, uh, mainstream media, Hollywood actors were all getting behind this bill, saying, oh, we need to have this done. It's the right thing to do. And if you don't agree with us, you're a hater. It got so bad that the mayor... A lot of pastors in town were opposed to it. The mayor then tried to seize their sermons in advance. They took the mayor to court. A judge, she, she tried to block the vote, first of all, because the council had voted in favor of it. 
And then when they, they got 55,000 signatures and only needed about 10,000 on a petition, she tried to block the vote, and a judge told her, hey, either the law takes effect after a vote by the public, or it doesn't take effect at all. And so they got shut down. They're not happy about it, and they vowed that they're going to continue to try to embarrass and humiliate people in order to go into the uh, girls' rooms, into the ladies' rooms. We've got a caller with us. You're on the air with Bill Colley on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News 1310.com. And what's on your mind? A hypothetical. Suppose your daughter goes to uh, France and Spain, and there's everybody. There's new beaches over there, topless beaches. Are you going to get into a fight with all the people that are right there so that they won't flash anything to your daughter? Here's a hypothetical. Do you have children? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, my daughter isn't going to Europe anytime soon. I don't care if she does or not. She's an adult. She can make up her own mind. But Jose there, maybe he, uh, he's, he, he's not too worried. Perhaps he thinks that, you know, he should have all sorts of little boys in, uh, in what you might call in, in excitement in the locker room with his little girls. Wouldn't that be fun? In fact, in Europe, speaking of Europe, which he brings that up, in some parts of Europe, you have people right now in Germany. This was a sad, sad story. I saw it over the weekend. Some people in the German health ministry are recommending that parents now massage their little boys and girls' private parts while they're young so that these children will better understand sexuality and prepare them for rampant sex as they get older. So apparently, you can that way raise a large Teutonic population and offset the, uh, the Muslim hordes that are now invading the country. You're up next. It's 825. You're on KLIX. You know, there was a time when you were allowed to be a child and and run around and just have fun and enjoy life and you didn't have to decide whether or not you were gay, lesbian or transgender or and and, and think about what it does to the children. They're loaded up with all this BS and they can't even just be children anymore. And And you just say, can you just Leave us alone and live your life somewhere in privacy. No, you got to shove it in my face, shove it down my throat. And my children, my grandchildren have to decide whether or not they're something. Can we just be allowed to live until we're ready to make a decision old enough to do so? But you see, never, never, because misery loves company. Well, and these people are miserable. I, I, and, you know, thank you for the call and the input. If you live in a narco-terrorist state, of course, where everybody gets married at uh, seven years old, I suppose it's irrelevant. But if you live in a civilized country like the United States, to a lot of people, these things are still very, very important. I, <laughs> I just, <laughs> you talk about allowing children to grow up and just be children. When my daughter was little, I went shopping with my mother and uh, my niece and my daughter. Took them all shopping one day. We were buying some back-to-school clothes. My daughter must have been seven, eight years old. And we were in this children's section of the store. And my mother pointed out something to me, and I was absolutely appalled. There were leather pants, black leather pants being sold for little girls. Now, I don't know about you. But I don't want my seven-year-old walking around the street like a, like a street walker. I don't want her doing it at 7, 17, 27, 37, 87. And yet, there are people who will go buy their little girls those clothes. That's why they happen to be in the store, because somebody knows they can sell those. And you drive down highways, and you would see billboards, and you would see children being overly sexualized on billboards. And I'm telling you right now, this is all part of a much more nefarious plan. You break down a culture by breaking down its morality. And that's been going on in this country really since the rise of, uh, of what you call mass media, but the control of it by something called the Frankfurt School. We have another caller with us. It's 828. You're on the air on Top Story. What's on your mind? Well, I'd like to tell my friend out there, this is not France. This is the United States. <laughs> and if he wants to live in France, cool, get on a plane. I'll pay the ticket. Uh, but I don't want my kids, I wouldn't want my grandkids in the same locker room with an opposite sex. 
trying to expose them to something that they don't need to be exposed to. This is the problem with a society today. They want to expose everybody to things too early. Let them grow up. Let them be kids. Let them figure out what they are without shoving it down their throat and telling them they have to decide by time to ten. That's just ridiculous. Hey, thank you much for the call. And as far as France goes, there's a major country that hasn't won a war in over 200 years. Been in a lot of them, and generally what they do is they just throw up their hands when they see the enemy coming. And during a four-year period in the 1940s, it's estimated that every child born in France had at least one German parent. So that should tell you what the French are all about. Uh, they are the definition of wuss. It seems to be part of a wuss gene that they're carrying. And right now, they are going to be overrun by the Muslim hordes, and within a few years, when the caliphate is extended through Paris and Lyon and all of the major Marseille, all of the major cities of France, there will be a new regime there, and the French aren't going to much like it. And no one will be walking around topless. Women won't be out, allowed out of the house unless they're wearing some sort of tent with just a couple of little eye slits. Coming up on 8.30, Dr. Jonathan Tripp or one of his associates will join us. Tripp Family Medicine on the way. Bill Colley with you, too. On News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com.